Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. And today I'm going to be carrying on with my working in publishing series with a slightly lighter video. And today I thought I would tell you about 10 weird side effects of working in publishing. So, what I wanted to do today was talk about some of the weird things that publishing makes me think about that I never thought about before I worked in publishing. Some of these I think are like publishing side effects for everyone who works in publishing, and some of them are specifically like editorial, or specifically my company, or specifically me. But these are certainly a lot of things I think about, or certainly a lot of like effects that my career has on the rest of my life that I thought would be quite fun to talk about, because some of them are quite silly. So, number one, I proofread everything. And I mean everything. I mean like if I go to a restaurant out for dinner, I will sit there reading the menu and I'll spot typos and I'll be like, oh, they've used inconsistent capitalization on their titles or some things are in italics and some things aren't and I'll get like really distressed about it even though no one cares except me, I care. And I'll be like on the tube and I'll look up from my book and I'll see an advert on the tube and I'll be like, oh no, they've used a hyphen where they should have used an end dash and it'll really distress me because it looks so wrong. And basically I can't help myself. I proofread everything. Number two. I'm obsessed with punctuation. I'm not that obsessed with spelling, I'm not that obsessed with grammar, but punctuation I am properly obsessed with. My emails are full of semicolons and end dashes where other people would use commas, and it get, makes me very upset when I see someone use a semicolon incorrectly. But what makes me really upset is when people use the wrong kind of dash. I become obsessed with dashes, so to give you all a brief lesson in punctuation here, there are three kinds of dashes. There is the hyphen, which is very short, there is the end dash, which is slightly longer, and there is the m dash, which is even longer. So the N dash is the width of the letter N, and the M dash is the width of the letter M. Basically, a hyphen is when you hyphenate words. It should be in the middle of two words, no spaces either side, to create a compound word. Or it should be used if a word is being split over a line break. An N dash is what you could use in place of a comma or a semicolon or a full stop when the sentence is flowing on, or you could use in place of two brackets when you are having something in the middle of a sentence um, that has been like sort of broken up. And it's often very useful in dialogue, um, and I find it's often very useful where you want a slightly shorter pause in a sentence than a semicolon, a slightly longer pause than a comma, and it can be used both where you might use a semicolon and where you might use a comma because what is either side of the end dash could be separate sentences or could be one sentence depending on the size of break. Basically end dashes are like the best form of punctuation, they are my favourite, I will use them everywhere. If you were ever to receive an email from me you would probably find three end dashes in it because I love an end dash. What I just explained about the end dash is only true in UK punctuation. In US punctuation you use the M dash for everything I've just said, um, but in UK punctuation you use the N dash for everything I've just said and the M dash is only used um, for like interrupted dialogue. So that is what should be at the end of speech if another character is interrupting another character. N dashes have spaces either side, M dashes do not. This is what I think about like from morning till night. I think about dashes, I get cross on the tube when adverts have used the wrong dashes, I get cross if I read a book and they've used the wrong dashes, it upsets me when I read a book that has US text because they have M dashes where I think there should be N dashes, and basically I just, I just live in dashes and it's weird guys. It's weird. Number three. I struggle now to read books without trying to cut or edit them in my head. Not always, but there is a bit of me that when I read a book I'm like, oh you could lose some words here, and then I have to remind myself that I'm not reading this for work purposes, and we don't have to think about when you lose words here. I also do it a lot when I read historical fiction, like looking for anachronisms. There's a bit of me that's like, oh I should raise that on copy edit, and then I'm like, no, no that's not what I'm doing here, this is, this is fun reading, I'm doing this for fun. And every now and then I'll be reading a book and I'll spot something I think is slightly historically inaccurate, and I'll be like, oh but if you change that you have to change that, and then I'm like, no but I'm not changing it, because that's that's how it is, and I can't change it because this is a published book. Number four, I now read books cover to cover, by which I don't mean I read all the novel in a book, I mean I read every single bit in a book. I mean I go through a book obsessively looking what the half title page looks like, this is a half title page by the way if you didn't know, and what they might have about the, about the author or the title page. This is the title page and usually doesn't have the same font as the cover, why have they done that, isn't that interesting. I then also like to obsessively read imprint pages, this is an imprint page, sometimes called a copyright page, just to see how they've done it and what they say and how it might be different to where I am, and also to look out for who the typesetter and the printers are, because it always makes me very excited if I stumble across a book that is typeset by a typesetter that we use at work. For example, Slade House by David Mitchell here um, was typeset 
by Palimpsest and printed at Clay's and Clay's is the printer that we use where I work and Palimpsest is one of the typesetters that we use. So when I read this book I got really excited about where it was typeset and printed which is weirdly geeky but kind of awesome. So in a book there is like the main bit of the book but before that is the prelims or the front matter which is what like what happens before the book and then at the end there is the end matter which is what happens after the book and I'm also obsessed with looking at the end matter especially when it's quite interesting. For example, in my edition of The Thirteenth Tale, where we have reading group questions at the end, it was always interesting to have a look at like how they've done reading group questions, or if they have like an about the author at the back or at the front, or illustrations, or if they have like um, a suggested further reading. That's always very interesting. I just like to see what they have at the back of a book because it's always very interesting. I also like to count the blanks at the end of the book and try and work out like if they were having trouble getting to the right extent. Because did you know that all books pretty much, depending on the printer you use, but mostly books have to be in multiples of 16. So if there are ever random blanks at the end of a book, that's because they didn't have enough book to get it up to an extent that was divisible by 16 and by extent I mean length in pages but we call it extents anyway anyway. On that note my fifth side effect of working in publishing is all the weird terms I use and which I use all the time and I can't use other words and I know that when I say extent I mean length but but I feel like I can't say length because I know it's an extent. Another weird term that is used in publishing all the time that I now just use in real life is comp. No one says compare in publishing and no one says comparative or comparison. Everyone just uses the word comp so we talk about comp titles which are comparison titles and we talk about a book being comped to another book by which we mean being compared and I don't know why we've got rid of all the letters in the middle but we have and we just do that now. I also call books manuscripts and titles much more than I call them books and I also now write book titles automatically in capital letters because that is how it is done in email so that the book title stands out so that people know what book you're talking about. Yeah it's a weird world. Sana from Books and Quills and Lena from Lena Norms actually did a video a little while ago talking about like publishing terms in which I would say that some of the terms they talked about are actually used slightly differently in different publishing houses um, but it's quite an interesting video if you want to hear more about weird publishing terms so I'll link that down below. Side effect number six I'm obsessed with typesetting and font. This is a relatively new side effect because I didn't have to think very much about font when I worked in illustrated nonfiction because that was usually done by a designer. Um, but now I work in fiction um, at the particular publisher where I work, we brief typesetters. So for example, I am the person who might say to the typesetter, this is the font we would like. Um, this is not one of our books, but it's here. So I'm going to demonstrate it because I have another thing to say about it in a minute. I am the person who might say to the typesetter, here is the font we would like. Here is how many lines we would like per page. Here is where we'd like the folio by which I mean page number but they're called folios so we're going to call them folios. Here is where I would like the running head which is what this is called, the bit that goes along the top. And if we have any letters or text messages in the book I might be like well this is the font we'd like to use for this. It's all very interesting and I become a bit obsessed with it so that now when I open a book for the first time what I think is not oh that's a beautiful sentence, what I think is oh that's a nice font. And I also have weird thoughts like the first time I opened The Wonder by Emma Donoghue my first thought was literally oh the font is quite small for a hardback that means that they have enough budget to reflow the text rather than do a direct reduction for the paperback and I wouldn't be surprised if you don't understand the sentence I just said but basically some hardback books and one of the reasons why text is often quite large in a hardback book is because what publishers will do is just do like a direct shrink down for the paperback like it will literally just be to scale shrunk down but sometimes the text will be reflowed by which I mean retype set by which I think you probably figure what I mean by that and if you come across a hardback where the text font is quite small then you know that the publisher has the budget to reflow it for the paperback which is is getting into a weird detail now which leads me quite nicely onto my seventh side effect which is that quite often when I look at books in a bookshop or on my shelf what I think about is the budget that was available for that book and what they've done with it and how much they've spent on that physical book as a physical object I think about that often as much as I think about like what the book is about because if a book has a particular finish and um, so there's lots of foil on this book which is why it's shiny and um, Slade House by David Mitchell has something unusual in that it's got like um, little cut out things um, from the dust jacket I don't know if you can see and um, which also would put the price up it also has quite a lot of foil and it also has um it has uh, I was about to call it spine brass which is what you call it on the side but it has foiling on the boards as well and it also has sprayed edges which is very fancy this was a special foils edition um, at the time when I was working at foils actually some paperbacks will have inside cover printing and some will not which is also another interesting thing to have a look at when you're looking at books 
and in general there's just a lot of different things that can be done to books as physical objects which I now find fascinating and I now notice much more than I ever did before. Weird side effect number eight. I now know a lot about books that I haven't read which I sometimes feel is as much a side effect of watching a lot of booktube as it is about working in publishing but quite often people will talk to me about a book and I'll be like oh yeah 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 I know what that's about and then they'll be like oh have you read it and I'll be like no no I just know about it because I know about books now but I haven't read that many I mean I have read lots of books I do read a lot maybe that should be one of my other weird side effects of working in publishing but it's not that weird because I think it's probably expected but I feel like I also as well as reading a lot know a lot about books that I haven't read which I find slightly weird because I don't think that used to be the case like four years ago though again I think that is probably like a combination of publishing and booktube together. Weird side effect number nine I'm now much more aware of like marketing campaigns and social media around books and I find it really interesting to see like what books are appearing on everyone's things on Instagram and therefore like seeing how a particular publisher has marketed the book. Especially interesting is when like an author's books kind of are taken in a new direction and change things for example um Taylor Jenkins Reid's most recent book, Daisy Jones and the Six, which was incredible, was sort of marketed a little bit as a debut, although it is not. She's written a lot of novels before, but all the talk about Daisy Jones was as a kind of like a relaunch um, rather than as a, oh, and she's written all these amazing books before. Um, although The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo did all right here, I think, it didn't do nearly as well as Daisy Jones and the Six has done over here, where it's been doing really well and it got into the Sunday Times bestseller chart. That's another thing I'm obsessed with now, Sunday Times bestsellers. But anyway, that's, that's, I only have time for 10 side effects here um but yeah I'm just much more aware of like how books are marketed and put out there and if I ever see posters for books I now like read them fully because I want to see exactly what they've done and I'm very curious and I obsessively look at like shout lines on the front of books to see what they've got um, and the effect that they have and just yeah I just spend a lot of time thinking about how books are packaged and positioned just a lot of time and finally weird side effect number 10 now every time I go into a bookshop I have to look for books published by the imprint where I work. Even to be honest if I go into a library I just like to look through all the spines and look for the Zs which is the logo of the imprint Zaffa where I work because I just like to see what's there and I just find it interesting and I, I just enjoy it. It makes me really happy when I see a book um, published by my imprint especially one that I've worked on like it's sitting in a bookshop because it makes it feel real and it makes it like it's nice to know that it's there and that someone could go along and pick it up and buy it um, which they do and that, that just makes me really happy so now like every time I go to a bookshop rather than like immediately looking at the tables for new books that I might want to buy for myself the first thing I do in a bookshop is look for books published by where I work just to see that they're there because it makes me happy to know that they're there so yes there we have it those are 10 slightly weird side effects of working in publishing I would be very interested to know anyone else who works in publishing if you also have weird side effects from working in publishing or anyone else who works in other jobs that might have weird effects on their everyday life I would find very very interesting because yeah some of these things are a bit weird but yeah I think that's all for today please let me know if you enjoyed this video and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video